Hello YouTube land, this is Brenton Son coming to you from Lexington, Kentucky, the Bluegrass State. If anyone out there has a story they would like to share here on this show, you can contact me at brentonson at gmail.com. If you'd like to contribute to help with the show, you can go to PayPal Me. The link is in the description. And I appreciate everyone who has uh, made a contribution. Now, um, today we have uh, Alfred, who is going to share uh, several different stories. Um, today, though, we're going to talk about these strange creatures that were coming out of the woods in, uh, in this particular neighborhood. And, um, and then he's going to come back on and share some other uh, stories like Bigfoot and Dogman and you know things like that he's got he's got quite a few stories that are pretty interesting um, so we'll get to that in a minute um, I picked up an advertiser um, and that helps out some that's for sure and this um, fella emailed me and he has a company called stocks at home dot com um, I went and checked it out basically in a nutshell I'll, we'll kind of cover this in, in a little bit on this video and in the next video and I'll you know do a little at a time but uh, he started trading stocks uh, as soon as he got out of high school and he was pretty good at it and he was sharing some of the information on Twitter and things like that and he noticed he started getting a following and he's got like 70,000 something uh, followers now but um they were wanting to know more because he was doing so good on trading stocks. So he started a uh, a website where you can um, join it. And this is the website here. Um, you can join it and he gives you when he buys, when he sells, all the details. So you can do exactly what he's doing. And, um, and I'll show you down here in a second. Hey, there's also testimonials here of people who follow him and uh and trade you know and some of them are full-time traders now but uh you can go through and look at like june 2017 his uh ratio of um increase was like 40 point i don't have my glasses on 40.5 percent may was 42.9 uh, and on and on and on uh, some months, you know, are down to like 29.5, but that's a heck of a return, 17.9. That's still a good return. Now, even when the uh, stock market dropped uh, 1,200 points yesterday, he still had a for that day a three point increase or three percent increase, um, and that's that's really good. That would add up over a month. Um, so basically, uh, 25 bucks a month, you join his site, and um, do what he does <laughs> and he tells you when to do it he'll tweet out to you need to join him on Twitter too uh, but he'll tweet out to you to sell this sell that or you know um, if something's dropping he sells early so it minimizes the losses and he holds on to the stuff that's gaining and you know and that's how you get a decent percentage um, I'll leave a link in the description go check him out we'll talk more about this in the future so Let's just go to our guest and get on with the show. Okay, Al, if you would, I'd like for you to introduce yourself, and then we'll get into your stories. Okay, Brenton. Uh, my name is Al Santariga. I'm the founder of the Bronxville Paranormal Society. Uh, you can find my team and my website on the Internet. Uh, we're, we're on everything, Facebook, Twitter, the whole nine yards, on YouTube. Um, I re but I'll be brutally honest, our website is way behind, but <laughs> Facebook is pretty caught up. Um, as a matter of fact, I just sent out a couple of reports to my editor today to, um, type up so I can, um, uh, post, uh, this month, um, on some, uh, investigations we did and some phone calls. We took, we have our own hotline and, you know, so we do paranormal investigations, but I'm, uh, I've been, uh, you know, part of the paranormal since, uh, I guess the day I was born. My mom was, uh, sensitive. She had, uh, premonitions. She always got premonitions. And, uh, my brother's been an investigator for 40, 50 years. He's a parapsychologist. He's got his own book out. It's called, uh, Frank R. Santa Riga, Paranormal Family and Friends. 
Um, you name it, you name it, I've experienced it. Um, so tonight, I guess you want to talk about that uh, insectoid thing that I seen back in, in the '90s, and uh, you know, we, we can go from there. Yeah, that, that sounds really interesting, and and also I want to let the audience know that um, you've been going through uh, battling a cancer and um, been going through chemotherapy, and I'd like to ask the audience to uh, um, keep you in their prayers um, that, that, that maybe somehow that uh, you, you can recover from what you're going through. And yes, the you, you've had a lot of experiences from what I you know was gathering from when when we uh, uh, conversed there through the email and what have you. And one of the uh, most interesting things that, that you were talking about was the mantid thing. I mean that to me that's one of the most interesting cryptids of all. Um, so if you would, I guess just. You know, kind of give a backstory and tell that story if you would. Okay, well, you know, I'm a mailman by trade. Uh, I work for the post office, and I was working in uh, one of the bigger cities in uh, southern Westchester. And I was doing a route that went along the Hudson River, and I noticed that uh, on one side of the street, the street, the side that actually faced the river, um, didn't. People on that time on that side of the river never seemed to move, and this was a high end area, you know, very high end neighborhoods, uh, big money kind of, you know, condominiums with pools on the roof, the whole nine yards. But the other side of the street that actually faced the woods, that seemed to be a high turnover, and I really didn't think much of it. You know, I just figured people were, you know, businessmen are always constantly moving, going, you know, all over the place, but. um one day, you know, I was uh, finished my route, and what I used to do was I used to take the aqueduct back to where I parked my car at the beginning of the route. We would park the cars at the beginning of the route and then walk the route. You know, in the city, you walk from house to house. There's no driving up, no coup de sac. It's, you know, house to house. Everything is on your shoulder, on the bag, and you go. And I was walking back. Uh, through the aqueduct, and, and I started to notice that all once I got past the couple of condominium complex, and I started getting to all the private residents in the neighborhood, I started to notice that all the private residences had these huge eight, ten foot fences, and it didn't really make any sense to me because the neighborhood was such a beautiful neighborhood, you know, like the mayor lived there, and just that kind of area, you know, and uh, so. Didn't think much of it, and I was holding down this route for about a year because the regular carrier was hurt. And again, it was in the summertime when I first started to hold it down. And one of the one of the days when I had finished the route, I was walking back to my car. Um, I always carry two pepper sprays on my bag because of dogs. They tend to get attacked by dogs a lot, so I want to make sure I got more than one to protect myself. And I'm walking back to my car, and I'm on the aqueduct. And I got this feeling, you know, and I call it a, a vibe. I don't know. If, you know, I don't claim to be a, parent, a, psych, a, psych, a psychic in any way, shape, or form. That's not who I am. I'm just a regular guy. And uh, I got this gut feeling. And I've always gotten gut feelings my whole life. And I got this gut feeling that I'm being followed. And I'm walking along the, the aqueduct, and I, I keep turning around like somebody is following me. But I don't see anything, you know, and I really, you know, it's really starting to bother me. So um, I'm walking, I'm walking along, and I said, you know what, that's it, I've had it. I, I turned and I pulled both of the pepper sprays off of my bag, and I ran to a location where I felt whatever this thing was was following me was at. And I figured since all the trees were green and everything for the summer, the pepper spray is red, and we're going to turn whatever they are red. And I'd be able to get a good look at it. And I sprayed the area down with the two cans of pepper spray. I didn't see anything leave. I didn't hear anything leave. Now, maybe it moved away when I ran towards it. I don't know. But when I got back to my car, uh, you know, I made sure I uh, reloaded the pepper cans with some new cans because I really emptied them out. And I made wanted to make sure I had fresh cans for the following day. So then I started walking, you know, started talking to the neighbors. And I started 
I started walking around and I'm talking to the neighbors and, you know, Saturday is a big day on the route. You see everybody cutting the grass and, you know, doing laundry and stuff, hanging out laundry and coming home with groceries and stuff. And I was talking to a few people and it was actually an NFL player who lived on the route and we became good friends. We always have like coffee for me at the end of the day or iced tea in the beginning of the day. And we started talking and I said, what's the deal? What, you know, why does everybody in the neighborhood have these, you know, 10 foot fences and, you know, these big dogs? It seemed like everybody had a killer dog, whether it was a Rottweiler or a Pitbull, a German Shepherd, a Dolman Fincher. You know, I think this is such a beautiful area, such a great neighborhood. I don't understand what all the security fences and these big dogs, you know. And uh, he said, oh, you know, well, he said, there are things in these woods that People just don't talk about, but, you know, anybody who's lived here for any period of time will tell you if they've seen them. So I said, oh, really? So I said, you know, what are we talking about here, you know? And he said, you know, and he said to me one night he was sleeping in his bedroom and he had gotten up to go to use the restroom. He was looking out his bathroom window and he seen to him that looked like a person jump over his like eight foot fence. And I was like, you mean climb? He said, no, this thing jumped over my eight foot fence. And, um, and, uh, what you would call it. So, uh, he said he looked out the window and he seen this thing walk over to his back door and, you know, jiggle in the back door. And, uh, he said he went downstairs, he grabbed the baseball bat, grabbed the baseball bat, and he went downstairs and to see what was at his back door. And I'm talking a big guy, you know, this is like an offensive lineman. This is a big guy. He's not afraid of much. And when he opened up, when he went to the back door and he put the back light on, he seen what he said was like a six foot greenish creature with long fingernails, not fingernails, but nail, uh, like claws, standing at his back door trying to claw its way in. So when he seen this creature, you know, obviously he slammed the door on it because the creature freaked out when he seen it because I guess the creature didn't expect him to open the door. And here's this big guy, a six-foot-nine guy with a big small bat, 300 pounds, and the creature ran and jumped over the fence and ran into the woods. So he called the cops, and the cops came, and the cops said, uh, yeah, you know, he needs to explain it to the cops what he's seen. And the only way I could explain it at the time when I was, when I seen it or when I was being told what it was, everybody always explained it to me as looking like the green goblin from the Spider-Man movies from the 90s, okay, with William Defoe. And I was like, really? That's what it looked like? And he said, yeah. He said, this thing was very strange looking. And the cops told him, no, you didn't see anybody. You, you didn't see a creature. You seen a person. They said, get a dog. Get a dog. Get a dog. Like everybody else, get a dog. Because apparently the dogs tend to keep these things out of the yards. So once he told me that story, I just started, you know, talking to every single neighbor, uh, neighbor I could find. And then I would ran across this one woman. This woman I always called Big Mama. She was a, she had a house for, um, home, um, wayward women. And, uh, she had, uh, two pit bulls. One was an older one and one was a, a younger one. And the older one looked like he had, you know, had been on death's door. So I said to her, and I said, Hey, Big Mama, you know, why, you know, two pit bulls in such a nice neighborhood? And then she went on to tell me a story. Um, she said, you know, at one point, something, the girls had all gone to bed, and uh, she had this one pit bull, and something had jumped over her fence. Now, her fence, I don't think, was as high as everybody else's. I think hers was only like six foot. And this thing jumped over her fence and was clawing to the door. And she heard the dog run downstairs and start barking and everything. So her and all these other good women that were in the house grabbed brooms and mops and everything. And they all ran downstairs. And when they got downstairs, they had a wooden back door. This thing was actually just about halfway through the door, clawing its way through when the pit bull attacked it. And they just, this creature was fighting the pit bull and it was really mauling the pit bull up and, and the big mama called the cops. The cops came. The creature ran off. They brought the dog to emergency. They actually saved the dog's life, but 
took a lot out of the dog and the cops told Big Mom, she said, you know, you really, you really need to get a, a steel fire door from the back. Everybody in this neighborhood's got steel fire doors. So that was pretty wild. That, that blew my mind, you know, and, and, the, and the women that were in the house and I talked to them, the girls and the ladies all said, yeah, they, you know, half of them were still around. They were there when it happened. So they all validated what Big Mom was telling me, but I didn't think Big Mom was lying to me anyway. She was a very sweet woman, you know. Um, but um, so then I get to the, to, to the north end of this route, which have all these beautiful condominium buildings, with you know, pools on the roof, just gorgeous view of the Hudson River. I mean, top dollar. These people all pay top dollar to live there. And I started talking to the maintenance guys who were all Spanish guys, Mexican guys. And I said, hey, you know, have you ever seen anything? And they all said, yeah, chupacabra, chupacabra. I had never heard of a chupacabra. And I said, what's a chupacabra? So I talked to a couple of Spanish guys that I worked with, and they gave me the rundown on the chupacabra. And they showed me a picture of it. And I was like, wow, that's a pretty creepy looking thing, you know. Thing kind of fit the pres- description of what the football player told me, but it was a pretty creepy looking creature anyway, you know, because the, the thing that everybody else seemed to be seeing was six foot tall, and the chupacabras were smaller, like three, four foot. But anyway, um, I started noticing as the season started to change and I was getting to the end of the route later when the male volume started to pick up during the school season and I was getting to the end of the route later. I started noticing that when the kids got off the buses, um, this, these two buildings had a breezeway that connected one building from the other so you wouldn't have to leave the building to go to one, one building or the other. And it had courtyards that were connected and the, actually, the mailboxes were on the out. They were inside the breezeways that overlooked the courtyards. And I started noticing when the kids got off the buses at school, none of them would look out the breezeway glass. They would all just turn, get off the elevator, and race to their apartments, you know. And uh, what I would do is after I delivered the mail, I would go to any apartment that had packages and just, you know, leave a package in front of the door, ring the bell. And I spent a lot of time in those breezeways in both of those buildings because those people got a ton of stuff. And so I seen everybody running and running. I was like, why is everybody running? What's the deal with these kids, you know? And I, then I started noticing that when the women got home from work, they would do the same thing. No one wanted to look out the breezeway. And I was like, man, this is crazy. So I started talking to one of the maintenance guys in the building, and he was telling me that every so often the apartments that face the wood uh, woods that have uh, you know patios on them, they would find patio furniture on the aqueduct, like a chair facing the building, like something was sitting in the chair just observing the building. And he said there was a point in time where they would find claw marks on the the patios from one patio to like something climbed up the patios. And uh, one of the guys told me he was up on the roof one day checking the pH level on the pool. And he was at the north end of the pool when something got out of the water that was invisible on the south end of the pool, walked toward the end of the building and we're talking about pretty big buildings here 16 stories high something like that you know and he said he'd either jumped from the roof onto the aqueduct or jumped down and, and shimmied down between floors on the patio but he said he's seen what he called alligator footprints you know walking away from the pool and he was like he didn't know what the hell was going on because it was invisible to him but he could see the footprints and he was freaking out, or lizard footprints, or something to that effect, he was saying. And he freaked out. And um, so one day, you know, uh, and, and this this particular road is a very long road. It goes for miles, okay? And it, and it, and it starts off down in the hood, and it ends up at, you know, a high-end level. And at some point over my years of working on that particular station, I worked that whole street and I always asked everybody and it didn't matter if you were, you know, at the high end of the the neighborhood or at the low end of the neighborhood, everybody knew there was something in those aqueducts and everybody knew to stay out of them at night. And like I said, 
Even even the guys in the hood, the gangbangers, like, man, don't don't go in those woods at night, bro. You know, and uh, or they would say, don't take those woods back to your car. You're crazy, man. You know, walk the street. But if I walk the street back to my car, it's like five extra blocks or a mile longer. You know. But anyway, one particular day, I'm in the in the in the foyer where the, where the breezeway is delivering the mail. And I felt like something was watching me. And, you know, you, you, you can't shake that feeling that somebody's eyeballing you or something. And I turned around and I looked out the breezeway window and I looked at the, the, the courtyard. And the courtyard had, it was a really beautiful courtyard. It had like an eight foot retaining wall. And I was looking at the eight foot retaining wall because that's where I felt like, Whatever was looking at me was standing there. Even though I couldn't see anything, I was looking at it. And I just thought in my head, I said, and I just said to myself, to myself I, I said in my mind, I know you're there. I know you, I know you can see me and I can see you. I said, just give me a sign because I know you're there. You know, I know you're there. And at that point, it flashed its eyes and I got these two green eyes that just flashed, just two eyes. They were like greenish yellow eyes and they flashed. And I was like, okay, now I, you know, you know, I can see you and I know you could see me because I could feel you. And when we kind of left it at that. And then we were, it was a couple of weeks later or, um, again, I was in that same building in the North End and I felt like something was looking at me, just watching me. And when I finished delivering the mail, you know, because it gets to the point where I stopped using that uh, bridal path or whatever that uh, to get to my car. I was driving to the building in my car, just parking in the parking lot, just going out the front door. Because I said, you know, in the fall, it gets dark. It gets dark in New York, like at 430. And I didn't want to be on that. On that, uh, in those woods at 4.30 at night by myself with nothing but two cans of pepper spray with something I can't see. So at one point I finished the route and I went down into the courtyard and I sat on a picnic table, but I sat on the top of the table, not on the bench bar. I put my back to it and I said, okay, I, I'm going to turn my back to you because I want you to feel comfortable around me. I want you, I want to see you. I want you to show me yourself. And I was sitting there for a little while, and I wasn't really feeling anything. And then all of a sudden, I got the cold chills like something was there. And when I turned around, um, there was this thing that was green in color. It had a white underskin, almost like a, a lizard on the bottom. But it was, but its head was almost like a an ant's head and I, and I didn't know what it was. And my brother who told me, he said, it's either an insectoid or a, a reptilian, which I had never heard of at the time. And I'm looking at this thing and this thing is standing there on an eight foot wall, skying over me, looking down at me. And it's about six foot tall. So to make myself bigger, I got up on the, on the table and stood up on the table just to kind of, give myself some girth because I'm not a small guy to begin with. I'm six foot, you know, six foot, you know, 250 pounds, uh, did martial arts my whole life. I'm pretty secure in my ability to protect myself, but you know, I don't know about this thing. So I'm looking at it and it's looking at me and we just look at each other and it flashed its eyes and it just disappeared. And I didn't know if it had left or if it just went, invisible, you know, to my eye, to the spectrum of light that I was looking in it at. But um at that point I couldn't I didn't know where it was, so I decided to bail and I left and I left and I um you know uh went went home, I called my brother, told him what was going on and my brother says, Oh, you know, you you, you gotta get statements from people. No one wanted a statement, you know, no one wanted to give me a statement. The Mexican guys were afraid they were gonna get fired for their maintenance jobs. And the people who lived there did not want to get involved in any way, shape, or form. It seemed like the people who lived in those buildings that faced the woods were constantly leaving within eight eight to ten months. No one stayed there that long. 
Um, for what the maintenance people told me, there was a point in time where they had to change everybody's sliding glass doors from wood frames to metal frames because this creature, whatever it was, and the vibe I got from this thing was that it was a cave dweller. Not so much that it was something from, you know, out of space or alien or something like that. Something that's been here forever, but something that was a digger. It didn't really know what glass was. I mean, because it could have, with its claws that it had on it, it could have broke the glass and jumped into these people's house and started, instead of trying to dig through their back doors and stuff, you know? And, um... So, you know, I don't know how intelligent it was, but it was definitely, you know, it had finger fingers, like five digits on each hand. They had long nails on them. I would say minimum of three inches each. So it was formidable for sure. Um, that said, I was down at a, one of the south end buildings, and there was a young girl who had just moved in to the north end side of the building. Her parents were both judges and they had lived on the south side of the building and she had got her own apartment and she was on the first floor which was crazy because it was right against the aqueduct there and she was telling me you know young girl she went she went down she, she worked in the city and she hung out in the city she partied in the city and i would usually see her on saturdays you know it looked like what the cat dragged it and we would talk and she told me she said you know you'll never believe what happened to me the other night and I was like what happened and she went on to tell me this story how she had parked right where the aqueduct comes out to her street right in front of the aqueduct there and uh, we hours of the morning three o'clock in the morning coming off of the city when this six foot tall green creature came out of the woods and chased her into her building now her building had had a, a, a two foyers. One you could walk into, the second one was locked. And she said she was able to make it to the first one and put her foot up against the door to keep it out and then get into the second one and lock the door behind her where she was safe inside. But when she went into her apartment, maybe this creature got her scent. I don't know. But this creature followed her along the aqueduct and was trying to break into her apartment from the aqueduct. So she called her father, who was, you know, a, a New York State judge. He had a, a gun. He came down with his gun. And um, according to her, her father took a couple of shots at this thing, and it ran off into the woods. And he doesn't believe he hit it or anything, but the following, you know, the f following week, not only did she have metal gates put on her windows, but she came home with the biggest German Shepherd you ever seen in your life. This dog was a monster. And, you know, when she came out into the hall with this dog, she would have to make sure there was nobody there because this thing was there for one reason and one reason only, to protect this girl, you know. And uh, that was pretty crazy. That was a pretty interesting story. And, you know, and, and that's, you know, it happened so long ago and, I really, to be brutally honest with you, I I haven't um, read my old reports on it because my brother told me to keep uh, like a, a dossier of everything, and I wrote everything down. And um, unfortunately, I didn't know you were going to call me tonight, so I didn't really read up on everything. That's all I can remember off the top of my head that goes along with that story. And uh, but it was. Uh, pretty wild you know pretty wild thing to see something like that not knowing what it was or where it came from and uh but it it seems like the police knew about it and everybody who lived along that aqueduct knew about it so it was it was a well-kept town secret but i guess if you spent any amount of time there like i did you know, a whole year delivering mail, day in and day out, six days a week, and you get to know the neighbors and everything, and you start conversations, and you know, or you 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 go into the local delis or restaurants, and you sit there and have lunch, and then you start talking to people. Once they get to know you, everybody tends to open up, and oh, you'll never believe what I see, and you're never gonna, you know, you're not, won't believe when I tell you this. So, um, it was pretty wild stuff. I mean, and that's basically. All I can remember regarding the insectoid creature off the top of my head, I'm sorry. 
Well, um, wow. I mean, that that sounded like uh, there was a lot of stuff in those woods. I mean, it almost sounds like there was some type of cave or portal or something that was in those woods that was, uh, you know, letting these creatures out. Um, what, what's your opinion on that? Well, those woods, <laughs> those woods are known to be haunted. There's been a lot of stuff, um, that's gone on in these woods from sun to sand, devil worshiping kind of stuff, um, to, um, very, very prominent families with mansions along those woods that have, um, what do they call them, rum runner uh, uh, caves that go down to the river. And these, these, these families have these, these caves that go down into their estates. And I'm talking about giant mansions like, you know, the get- J. Paul Getty kind of stuff. And it would lead down underneath the woods, through the woods, underneath the roadway, underneath the train tracks. And bring you right out to the river. And these people actually had, um, you know, docks down there and beaches for their boats and boathouses and stuff like that. So there was a lot of uh, smuggling tunnels and stuff like that. But, um, I mean, you know, I can tell you experience that happened to me and my wife in those woods one day. Um, we were in the woods. This is going back 30 years ago. We were just dating and we went into the woods that day, not the woods, but there's a park that sits above the woods. And we were sitting in the park having a beautiful picnic, you know, beautiful sunshiny day, just a gorgeous day. And my wife, well, my wife now at the time, my girlfriend, she said, do you know where the the devil worshiping caves are and off the aqueduct? And I said, yeah, you know, I've I've been there as a kid. Sure, I know where they are. She was going, why don't you show me? So I'm like, okay. And um, the minute we got up to start to walk to the back of that park, and I'm, when I tell you there wasn't a cloud in the sky that day, it was a beautiful, sunny summer day. As the closer we got to the back steps of that park that led down to the aqueduct, which led down towards those condominium buildings, towards the river, the whole nine yards, it got darker and darker and windier and windier when all of a sudden by the time we got to the to the top of the steps it was scary i mean it got dark and it got scary and we were walking down the steps and as we were walking down together and the the name of this park is unto myers park in yonkers new york and anybody listening to this can google that park and google the history of that park it's just renowned for devil worshiping. And um, as we're walking down those steps, we hear what sounds like wings flap, go over our head, flapping and go over our head. And we both kind of duck at the same time and look behind, because you could feel the whoosh and you could hear the sound, whoosh. And we kind of ducked and we both looked at behind us and we looked at each other and we looked in front of us and there was nothing there. And we were about halfway down the steps, maybe a flight or two before we got to the aqueduct. And once you got off the aqueduct, if you go right, you go to the old horse stables that were all burnt down and, and stuff like that. And if you go left, you go to the, to the old caves where they did the devil worship. And, and we're sitting there. And my wife says, okay, I'm good. She didn't want to go any further. We we're both standing there. And we're both looking to our right at the aqueduct, like a clearing on the aqueduct. And I'm looking there and she's looking there. and Neither one of us really want to go any further. And I says, what are you feeling? You know, what are you looking at? And she says, what are you looking at? And I was like, I don't know, but I got the vibe that there's something standing right there looking at us, you know, that's, you know, demonic, you know, the vibe I got was like demon. And she said the same thing. She said, I feel the same way. And she said, I'm done. Let's leave. So I said, you know what? We don't have to go down to the caves because this park is so unique. It's got a thing that they call the bird cage where things 
had been, you know, practices have been done. And also another thing, it was like, um, uh, what you call it, a, a clamshell kind of thing that they used, um, that the devil worshippers use for their practice. So I said, you know what? Instead of going down the back of this woods and onto this aqueduct, we both got a bad vibe that there's something there that doesn't want us there. Let's go back up towards the front of the, the park. And now we're on a paved road. It's, it's a paved road with the parks department used to drive their vehicles to clean up after everybody, after concerts and stuff. And there's a park where they always had concerts and, you know, always a lot of people there. Beautiful, beautiful park. And as we're walking back towards the bird cage, again, we hear that whoosh come over our heads and you can feel the, the wind push you and your back and your hair. And we both stopped dead in our tracks. And now we're like 100, 200 yards away from the back steps going south, uh, in a total different direction. And it is this huge oak tree to our right with this giant branch that crosses over our path. And we both stop and we both look up and we're looking at this branch that crosses over our path. And I say, what are you feeling? And, of course, my wife says, what are you feeling? I was like, well, I feel like there's something up there watching us, you know. And she's like, "That's I feel the same way. I go, what are you What are you seeing? Explain to me what you're seeing. And she says to me, I don't know if you remember, but back in the 70s, there was an old uh, TV movie called The Gargoyles. She said, if you remember what the leader of the Gargoyles looked like, that's what I'm seeing in my mind's eye up on that up on that branch and she floored me because I'll be brutally honest. I was seeing the same exact thing. I didn't even know she'd seen that movie because she's younger than me. I didn't think she even knew what the gargoyles was because it's a seventies TV movie, but that's what we were both seeing up there. And then she said to me, you know what? Let's just get the hell out of there. And we left that park that day and we've never been back. And, my in-laws live right across the street in a condominium de- development, and we've never taken our children to that park in the 30 years we've been married, um, you know, just to hang out because of that experience. We've never gone back. That's, that, well, then that's that, you know, little uh, thing that happened there. Well, um, on the mantid thing that you saw, it, you, yeah, you, you yeah. said you saw something with like an ant type head. That yeah, is that is an fascinating. Insectoid head. Yes. Can you can you kind of give a description of the creature you saw? Uh, uh, if if you Google Spider Man from the movie the nineties with William Defoe as the Green Goblin, that's what I see. It looked just like I called it the Green Goblin when I spoke to my brother, and my brother said. Don't ever tell anybody the Green Goblin because they're going to think you're an idiot. And I was like, well, I don't know any other way how to explain it because that's what I seen. It was William Defoe's the 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 outfit William Defoe wore in in, in the Spider-Man movies in the '90s. That's what I seen. That's what it looked like. And, and it had an ant-like head. Yeah, the head. If you, if you look at the head on the, on that on that. Um, on that, uh, on William Defoe's uh, uniform or costume or whatever you want to call it, it was bulbous like an ant. It wasn't. It wasn't like uh, an insectoid. You know, I mean, it wasn't like a reptilian kind of head. It was more insectoid to me. But the skin was green and the undercoat was white, and that looked like almost like li- uh, lizard kind of skin. So it was like it was a very strange looking creature. Right. So, so if you were to give a description of it, it, it would be like a, um, a, the skin would be, it, it, it was like it had skin, but it was like it was an ant type um, creature. I would say every, did, did, did it, it didn't walk, have a tail. Did it walk on twos or, or fours? Yeah, so it was definitely, it was bipedal, it was bipedal, and the, uh, the, its feet were um, humanish, almost like a, the lizard man, only without without the lizard head and the lizard tail. It had like alligator feet, almost. You know what I mean? Like the claws in the front were 
alligator-ish. Right. But the back of the foot was almost like humanoid. Right. Um, and the skin was green, and his underskin was white, almost like an alligator's belly, you know? What do you mean by and, underskin? Uh, well, you, you mean the, like the, the, the belly, on. the belly, okay, the belly okay. of it. All right, I got the, you. The belly of it, the belly of it looks white, almost like an alligator belly. But uh, but uh, everything else was greenish. It looked uh, very um, um, lizardish like. Right. But the head, but the head looked like I don't know, for lack of a better definition, an ant's head. You know, something like like a big black ant, one of those big head, the heads they have. You know, I don't like I said, I didn't know how to, I didn't know how to describe it to my brother because my brother's been doing this for fifty years, and right. and the only way I, the only way I could describe it to him was Green Goblin. That was the only thing I could relate to because I had you never know, heard of the word. You, you know how um, um, when when the Bible talks about uh, Nephilim, they corrupted uh, flesh and stuff like that. Um, they corrupt, they corrupted human flesh, and it made the nephilim and stuff. But it says they corrupted, uh, they corrupted all flesh. Um, so not only just human flesh, but they were messing around with the DNA of all uh, types of flesh, like insects and everything. So do you think oh, that, yeah. that has something to do with that? Well, uh, you know what? Um, when I read the Book of Enoch. It kind of opened up a lot of uh, a lot of, made a, let a lot of light bulbs go off. You know what I mean? And right. It, it 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 really taught me a lot. There was a lot of stuff missing from from I, which I couldn't. I've read the the Christian Bible. I've read the Jewish Quran. I've read the I mean the Hebrew Quran. I read the, Torah. the Islamic uh, Torah. I read I read it all. I mean, vice versa, the Torah and the Quran. I've read all three and. To me, there always seemed to be something off. Something was missing. But when I read the book of Enoch, it kind of put everything into place to me. And, and it, I learned a lot from that. And, and like the book of Jasher, too. Um, there, cause, cause there's extra information in those books. Um, that, that, uh, it, it's not like you can't find tidbits of that in the Bible. But, um, it helps you to understand what those tidbits are. There's little, oh, there's little, little pieces of information in the Bible that refer to the book of like Enoch and Jasher. Yes, absolutely. And, and, yeah, and, and so it points you into that direction. And and when you look into those books, then you you, you start to see that there was some type of uh, um, genetic manipulation uh, that was going on. Um, and they were doing some crazy stuff, you know. I mean, it's it's crazy. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I I don't know if it was natural genetic uh, manipulation or uh, unnatural. That I couldn't tell you, but there was definitely something going on for sure. Right. Yeah. And, and that, that, that's the same opinion I have. I I, I don't know if it was like actual. Uh, I I think at some points it was like actual sexual activity. But then, then I think that it might have changed to manipulation of DNA through scientific method. Um, because yeah, I, when, I, I when you, totally agree. When you hear when you hear about the all the abduction scenarios, it's like they're taking the genetic material and they're doing something with it. Uh, and, and so it was like, okay, they were trying not to violate those. Uh, um, rules that basically that exist uh, you, you know what I'm saying like uh, with having straight out sex and stuff like that so they were uh, doing it for through a genetic method and they would take DNA and then it, they would mix it and stuff like that and, and if you look at the Sumerian text man the, the Sumerian text it, it's like a, they have uh, the same type of stories uh, where, yeah, where, where they mixed these people and 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 uh they could create anything they wanted it it was like in, in the Sumerian text they they have they have people that were created and they were too strong so they had to dial it back uh where they had weakness <laughs> you know they, you know it was yeah. like okay we're going to dial this back so they have a weakness 
and because they, they they didn't want them to be that strong and and uh so I mean, to me that just is that, that sounds very interesting to me um what what how much of that's true because I, I know that we can depend on the scripture for being true extra biblical right. t- uh, text uh is either uh, uh historical or it's not um, so I, I, I don't know uh, that that's the mystery of it um, but but to me it, it, it's like the, the stories that you tell and all the stories I collect um, it seems like to me that there's something to it um, because the, these creatures are too strange you know <laughs> and they're too varied and and I've had varied uh, um, encounters with all different kinds of stuff, kind of like you have, and you. I know that you were uh, really reluctant to come on and share your stories because you had so many different kinds of stories, and because you've had Bigfoot and Dogman and and uh, you know all these different co- uh, types of stories, and you were worried that people were going to think you're crazy, but <laughs> but but look, I've had the same thing. And, and I've shared it, and, and you know, it's like people have have listened to me, and, and uh, why would you, would you think that anyone would think you're crazy for saying the same thing? You know, there's some people that see this stuff, some people that don't. Uh, you know, I got you know, I got. You I gotta, can't I gotta worry about it. What well, you can't worry about what they think. No, no, and I don't, I, and I never have. I mean, people either love me or hate me, and that's just the way God made me, and, and I'm good with that, as long as I know what side of the fence you're on. But I got a great story for you, real quick story. I was invited upstate New York by a group of people that called the Bigfoot Researchers of the Hudson Valley, okay? And they invited me up to one of their hotspot locations to check out some of their um, structures that they had. Okay, so I'm up there with one of my guys, Brian. He's my tech guy, and I'm up there with um, Deb, who's one of the, one of the one of the people from the from the team. Um, Deb and Gail, and Gail had to stay behind. She was working, so Deb brings me to one of her hot spots, and she's showing us all this, you know, these woods, and it's private property. You can't go on there, you know. So it's not like kids going on there building these structures and stuff because it looked like. It actually looked like an Indian uh, Native American longhouse the way this thing was built, and we're and we're in the middle of the woods in the middle of nowhere, and I start being pulled deeper into the woods to like the south, the southeast, the southwest, and I'm going, I'm going, and my my guy Brian is standing with Deb, and they're off on the side of the road talking. And I go, and I end up in the middle of the woods, and I'm standing on this huge log, and I says to Deb. I said, Deb, what, why was I being drawn here? What happened here? You know, what, what is this spot that I was being drawn? Because one minute I'm, you know, a uh, hundred yards away to my right, and next thing I know, I'm in, and she says, oh, my God, Al, don't move. I want to show you something. And she pulled up a photograph on her tablet that she took while she was in there squatching one night. And right where I was standing, she caught a picture of one of those, what I call the green goblin creature, right where I was standing. She had a picture of it on her laptop and she called it an alien. She said, I got a picture of an alien running through the woods and he, and I caught him right where you're standing. And I said, well, that's the reason I was drawn here. And she goes, I don't know. She goes, but right where you're standing is where I was standing back there. And I took the picture and I caught this creature running through the woods and it looked exactly like the thing that we just discussed. And I was like, Oh my God, I've seen this thing before, you know, like, you know, 20 years ago, you know, and I was telling her the story and she was like blown away. And I actually, at one point, she was leading myself and Brian to a different part of the woods to cross over the stream. It was a bridge that she wanted to cross over. She wanted to show us the other side of the stream. And I was like, nope, I'm being pulled to the left of this bridge. And to the left of that bridge, it's just been an incline that goes down like a 90 degree, 90 degree angle, you know. And when I looked over the edge of that bridge, there was an 18 inch uh, Sasquatch footprint right there. And she was like, Oh my God, what, 
what made you come here? And she goes, I said, I don't know. I was just being drawn here. So whatever the Sasquatch was, it came, it ran, it took one step off that ledge and jumped straight down towards the, the water. But, I mean, you know, she she actually went back and built a, a frame and everything and cast it. She's got an 18-inch footprint of what I found. But uh, to find those two things in thousands of acres of woods, you know, it's just, you know, how do, how do you how do you justify that? I don't know. Right. Uh, yeah, eighteen inch, uh, eighteen inch footprint. That's pretty big. <laughs> That's a big boy. Yeah, That's a big old uh, ombre there. Uh, <laughs> <Absolutely>. <laughs> for real, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And, and yeah. being barefoot and all that kind of stuff, man. It, to me, that's just not hoax kind of stuff. Um, no, and it was only one foot. It was a right foot. Like something jumped over the ri- over the edge, hit with its right foot, and then when it landed, it must have landed down either in the water or in, on the rocks below because there was nothing, no other footprints down below. So just one footprint. Oh yeah, they can jump a tremendous distance. Uh, yeah. Uh, and even go into the trees, you know. Um, oh yeah. A lot, of, a lot of people don't realize that. Sometimes they'll they'll jump into the trees and they'll travel from tree to tree, and and uh, oh yeah, absolutely yeah. When I when I go out and I do go to my hot spots where we have we have a, a, a clan that that we associate with that we have a really good rapport with, I'm always searching the trees because I always feel like you know they're not not only they're not only coming down through the you know the game trails and stuff but they're coming down on the trees as well especially when it gets dark and you can't see them and, and but when, uh, when you said something about them being um caves um yeah i think, I think I there's something was, to that too because uh, what i uh, what i think about it when, when uh, people talk about the, like the flood came and it destroyed all flesh from the face of the earth but it also says that 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 the Bible says that there was a Nephilim in the land in those days, and also after that. So yeah, and you know what, the yeah. Hopi, the Hopi Indians talk about the ant people who brought them down into the caves to, so, so yeah. they could survive the great floods. You know right. what I mean? Yeah, so, yeah. so, so you know, all flesh that, that survived was was uh, um, all all flesh that was killed was on the face of the earth. But if you weren't right. on the face of the earth, then you were, you, you could live. And, and right, if you, you take, survive. for example, um, like the ants and stuff that are in, uh, um, uh, uh, like in uh, w- the place that flooded here, New Orleans, yeah. And right. It was flooded for weeks and weeks. And uh, when the flood waters receded, the ants came back out of the ant ant hills. Yeah, it, yeah. Because they had tunnels. Uh, like if you take like your plumbing, for instance, um, <laughs> if you don't, like, if you don't, if, yeah, if you don't have like a vent on your plumbing for the water to drain, it's kind of like when you stick a straw into the water and you put your finger over the top of the straw and you pull the straw out. It'll hold the water. Yeah. Uh, you know, so you know, uh, all plumbing has a vent on it. Uh, if it oh, doesn't absolutely. have a vent, if it doesn't have a vent, it won't drain. You Plus, they has elbows to catch water. It only goes so far. You were, yeah, yeah, I you mean, know, you know, on, on your house, you you have a vent that comes out the top of your roof. Oh, that absolutely. Let, that, lets, that lets the uh, plumbing have air that can be pulled in, and uh, when the the plumbing. Uh, pulls the air in the water drains out so if, if you plug that up your your plumbing won't drain <laughs> no and period so yeah. um you know it, it's kind of like a a, a, a physics lesson uh-huh. um you, you know what i'm saying it, it, it's really oh, a, a, it's a physics I- kind of thing yeah, I mean, I have, I have, I don't have uh, town water. I live in a little town upstate New York. I have, I have a pump and a well. You know what I mean? And we have to run two lines. 
one to pump the air in and one to for the water to come come out of you know that that's how it works right otherwise the yeah. water's not going to come to you if you don't pump air pressure in it or two to get it to come up that you know that other that other hose that outlet hose so you know I understand yeah. the concept believe me yeah, I mean it, it, it can work by gravity or it can work yes. by pressure or it yes. Can, but but either way, it has to breathe. All right. You know, nothing will drain out of a pipe unless you have a way for it to suck air into the pipe. Yes. And and uh, you know, so so people need to kind of understand that part. Um, and when it talks about Nephilim being in land in those days and also after that, and it destroyed all flesh on the face of the earth. That you need to kind of get the fact that there was things that, like in Amos talks about those who dug themselves in and and uh, they 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 escaped God God was saying in the scripture I, I understand that some of you dug yourself in to try to escape the judgment you know uh, if, yeah because when he flooded the earth you know there's people that went into the inner earth and and uh, and they were trying to escape all the judgment. Uh, of and, and they killed. find they find those tunnels. They find those tunnels all over the world. They find those tunnels. Yeah, and that's Everywhere how you, that's how there was Nephilim in the land in those days, and also after that, because yeah. because you know it confuses people on after that. Um, right. You know there was there was Nephilim also after the uh, the flood. Great flood, I mean, yeah, and that's how you had Goliath and those, those kind of yeah. people. You know that that was after the flood, and you know um, Israel was hunting them down all the time and killing them, and yeah, and, uh, and, and you know so so you know that. So with the Native Americans and with their stories of the red haired giant, right? Yeah, yeah, right. yeah, yeah, and 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 I think the 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 hairy ones that that uh, we we considered to be the Bigfoot, um, I, I believe were the uh, um, descendants descendants of Cain after he was ostracized, because um, it was it, it was said that he was ostracized, and he right. was marked with a mark that was called caused fear to come upon people, and. Uh, you know, if 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 they were to mix with the children, he had, the daughters he had before he was ostracized, they would look human. Right. And if they were to mix with the ones after he was ostracized, they would have this mark of whatever it was that uh, um, he was marked with that would cause fear to come upon people. And and when you think about it, uh, um, the the uh, people who were marked uh, with this mark, um, ha when people would come across them, they would fear. fear. And, uh, you know, like you, you look in the book of Jasher, and I've talked about this several times, um, uh, th that Tubal Cain and his grandson came ac across some something that looked like it was a beast. Right. And they shot it with a bow and arrow from afar off and killed it and they walked up to it and it was Cain why would they think that Cain looked like a beast why, why would they think he looked like some type of animal Other yeah than I mean unless it, it looked with, like a Sasquatch or something you know yeah I'm saying he looked like an animal and, yeah. and, uh, and they ended up killing him um, but if the daughters of uh, Cain were still mixing with the uh angels of God and create Nephilim even after that then you know there would be uh, g genetic traits uh, that were passed along uh, and, and that, that I think that's what created the Sasquatch I, I really do uh, because yeah I mean I, 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 I don't know uh, I don't know I mean I've had a lot of, I do we do we do a lot of um Sasquatch expeditions, uh, my team and I, and I mean, on, on they another are hairy. Time, can, I mean, they are hairy. Oh yeah, they're, they're, they're are hairy giant. Beasts, without a doubt, they, they, they match but, everything about the Nephilim, being giant, yeah. being uh, hairy, uh, uh, causing fear, 
to come upon people when they come across them. Because uh, cause when you come across a, a Bigfoot, man, it, it's scary. And, uh, you, you know, that's, that, that's how me, I, brother. Uh, look, when, when people tell me that they saw a Sasquatch and they don't talk about the fear that they had, I don't believe them. Because it, to me, it's like, dude, um, every time I've come across them, it's like, it scared me. Uh, well, to, to I'll, the point I'll be, where I'll I don't want to go camping I'll, again. <laughs> You know. I'll be I'll be brutally honest with you. Um, the first time I seen it, I was 12 years old, and when someone asked me what it was, I said it looked like King Kong. Okay, and I was scared to death, and I had nightmares for years, at least three years of nightmares. Um, but now, when I go out, you know, in my in my old age, um, we never go out and do an investigation, whether it's paranormal, ghost hunting. Sasquatching, uh, any you know UFO investigation. If there, we never go out. I never let anyone come out with any subconscious fear because um, my psychic tells us that you know if you go out with any kind of uh, subconscious fear, it's a weakness and something can attach itself to you. Now I've been out in the woods many, many times since I was a kid, and I've come across these creatures many, many times. Um, you know. Never again standing, you know, three feet in front of me screaming like King Kong. But we've had so many different kind of experiences, you know, and I always try to tell everybody, the worst thing you could do is run. Never run. And I'm always the guy. And I'll, next time we talk, I'll tell you about what happened the last time. I went out with a couple of ghost hunters, and um, they wanted to put it on their, wanted to scratch it off their bucket list. Well, they did. and. You know, uh, you know, I don't run anymore. I don't run. I don't run. I stand my ground. I hold my own. And because of the relationship I have with this particular clan at this area, I've never been, even though we've been bluff charged and we've had rocks thrown at us, I've never felt that we were in harm's way. You know, there's a point. Well, they'll let you know it's time to go. And at that point, you have to pack your bags and you have to go. But um, we've had many, many experiences over the years. And next time we talk, we can talk about some of those things. And I'm telling you, the last time I went out with these girls, something, it's going to blow your mind. Yeah, I, I, I think that the uh, um, when it comes to the Bigfoot thing, that there's like rules. Um uh, because they, you know, if it was Cain's descendants after he was ostracized, they're commanded to be away from people. And if you think about it, what is the only creature that hides from people all the time? Okay, so um, when it comes to uh, a Bigfoot, they're supposed to be private and, and away from uh, human human people. And and these things tend to do that, uh, you know, to to the extreme, and you know, and, and when they come across people like you, um, they they hold back. I mean, they 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 don't like completely engage in a way. I mean, you know, they don't they don't uh, let themselves be known or let pictures be taken of them, and you know, things like that. So to me, that makes perfect sense on that that kind of theory and uh yeah and, and and i'm not one of those guys who goes out every weekend and bother them you know what i mean we go out maybe um two three times a year you know to our our hot spot location we've actually found what i believe to be a sacred site and um you know so we're not constantly out there harassing them you know what i mean we give them it's far and few between where, you know, I know some researchers, they find a hot spot and they just camp out there all the time. And it could be, you know, very frustrating for these creatures if they're trying to hunt or just survive. So we give them a lot of space. But um, like I said, um, I don't let anything scare me anymore. I'm at that stage in my life where I just, you know, it takes a lot to scare me. I haven't been scared in a really long time, you know, and I'm always like the voice of reason. And when next time we talk and I tell you about the last expedition we did with 
you'll understand it. I ten right, thousand yeah. thoughts went through my head in a matter of a thousandth of a second. So, I mean, it's it's amazing stuff. I mean, it's just crazy so, stuff. So next time we'll start to get into your uh, Bigfoot stories, your Dogman stories, and uh, and the other kind of stuff that you have because you've got all kinds of stories. Uh, yeah, I'll be I'll be brutally honest, Jay. Yeah, for the stuff. Um, you know, like the demonic stuff uh, that I've experienced over the years and uh, stuff like that. I don't even put on the website or the Facebook page. I basically keep it UFOs, Bigfoot, Dogmen, stuff like that, because I don't want it to be too overwhelming for people, you know, right. to but really... The, um, the demo- you know, the demonic stuff is, uh, is important um, because that helps tell part of the story. You know. Oh, absolutely. I mean, and 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 the stories, the stories, run deep. You know, very, very deep. Really, right, really right. do. So we'll, I mean, we'll pick it apart and, and, and uh, okay. see, see where we go with it. But I really <laughs> appreciate you sharing what you have, and I know that you've had chemo and stuff today, and uh, and you're not feeling that well. So I really appreciate you sharing what you have shared, and. Uh, I- so God bless you, brother, and 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 uh, we'll be praying for you, and I'm gonna get the audience to pray for you, and and we'll Thank uh, you. we'll take it from there, um, and expand on it from uh you know for the next time. Is that cool? Thank you, thank you very much, and I, and I and I'm actually I'm happy that you ended up calling me later in the day than early in the day because the first half of the day was a really bad day and. The second half of the day has been much better, so thank you for uh, You're welcome. calling me later. And, uh, and thank and you. thank you for your audience. You know, anyone says a prayer for me, a light the candle, it's, it doesn't go unappreciated, believe me, because every time I hear or see something on any, uh, any of the suburbs that I'm associated with or any of the groups, I'm, the first thing I do is I always go to the church and I, and I light a candle. It doesn't matter what denomination you are. I always say a prayer and light a candle for everybody. So thank you. Well, I appreciate that. And, uh, God bless you. And, and uh, if you want to stay on the line, I'll wrap this up. Okay. Um, everybody sure. out there in YouTube land, I really appreciate you listening. Um, it, it, you know, if, if you want to... Uh, share a story then you can go to brentonson at gmail.com and and uh share your story and i'll leave that that uh, information in the uh, description stocks at home.com um i'd like for you to go check that information out too and we'll check you out on the next video bye-bye